Hello everybody and welcome back to the damage report. I'm John Iderola, still sick, a little bit better. Um, and so I've given myself the right to wear my comfy jacket. You can't stop me by the time you got to the studio, the show had already be done. So I guess you're stuck with me. But anyway, uh, through the course of this hour, we are going to have a little bit of fun. Although the topics are fairly serious, we're gonna start off with an analysis of the war powers clause of the constitution. Uh, what was it intended to accomplish? What does it mean in the modern era? And what are the efforts going on right now to make it mean actually something that has to do with American foreign policy? Uh, so we're gonna talk about that. We've also got a documentarian who's gonna join us in just a little bit. Hedrick Smith went around the country to look at the efforts of popular populist movements to sort of reinvigorate American democracy, fight back against gerrymandering and things like that. We've got congressional candidates gonna be joining us a little bit later on. And then we don't normally do too much coverage of endorsements in this Democratic primary process. But over the past 24 hours, there were a number of big ones that came down. And so we do wanna give credit to the candidates for the endorsements that they've gotten over the past day. Before all of that, let's start with some domestic news coming out of the back and forth in DC yesterday. Yesterday, the Pentagon held a briefing for lawmakers about the intelligence that they supposedly had that justified the killing of Qasem Soleimani last Thursday night. Now, we're not gonna go over all the details of it. I'm sure you're familiar to some extent with some of the criticisms from Republican senators Rand Paul and Mike Lee, with Rand Paul saying that the briefing itself was an insult to the Constitution, and Mike Lee saying it's the worst briefing he's ever been in. Which is interesting because Donald Trump responded to a question about Mike Lee's comment by saying, I had calls from numerous senators and numerous congressmen and women saying it was the greatest presentation they ever had. That didn't happen, nope. nobody said, I just wanted to let you know, I've seen a lot of PowerPoints. That one, mwah, the best, nobody, nobody said that. Um, but anyway, uh, apparently, like judging by the reaction of people come out of the room, um, nobody really changed their mind. The people who felt like there was no actual intelligence uh, showing that he was a, an imminent threat came out believing that none was presented. Those who believed that it was awesome to kill him, they didn't go in needing any evidence, and so they left with everything that they needed. Um, but one scary thing that apparently happened in that meeting that I hadn't previously seen discussed yesterday came out in an interview with Mike Lee from NPR's Rachel Martin. She asked him, what kind of hypotheticals were you putting to them in hopes of understanding when the administration sees a need for congressional authority? Mike Lee responded, as I recall, one of my colleagues asked a hypothetical involving the supreme leader of Iran. If at that point, the United States government decided that it wanted to undertake a strike against him personally, recognizing that he would be a threat to the United States, would that require authorization for the use of military force? The fact that there was nothing but a refusal to answer that question was perhaps the most deeply upsetting thing to me in that meeting. And so understand what he's saying there, they, they did these hypotheticals. Like at what point will the White House acknowledge that it is supposed to be Congress that is authorizing war? And so taking an action that is tantamount to declaring war on a nation should require congressional involvement, or at the very least, like knowledge, the fact that they knew that it would happen. They didn't get that with Soleimani, but now even taking out the number one man in the Iranian government, the most powerful individual in the Iranian government, they would not confirm that they would actually let Congress know about it. And so effectively, all of that stuff in the Constitution about the legislative branch being the one that is responsible for declaring war, raising armies, all of that stuff, the White House is declaring, not just to the Democrats, but to the Republicans as well. Remember, Mike Lee is a Republican, a hard right Republican. They're saying, no, we're done with that. We're not doing that anymore. And Mike Lee is getting a little bit of a taste of what Justin Amash got last year. Any Republican who dares to question Donald Trump, even just to point out, hey, the Constitution is pretty unambiguous on this, is going to be attacked in the most vicious fashion ever. So Justin Amash was literally run out of the party. Take a look at what Lou Dobbs had to say about Mike Lee last night. Senator Mike Lee having something of a snit fit today. He came out in support of Tim Kaines, that's right, the former Democratic candidate for vice president. Uh, to limit President Trump's military authority. Senator Lee's uh, Benedict Arnold impression and his announcement follows a classified military briefing on Iran that Lee called the worst he's ever seen. So uh, Mike Lee, because he said, hey, by the way, Constitution's clear, you're supposed to let us know about this stuff. He's Benedict Arnold, he's a traitor to the country for just, like Mike Lee, 
He's not voting to remove Trump from office or anything. He's not bolting to the Democratic Party. He's just saying, hey, like we have a separation of powers. We just we just do. And by the way, Republicans, we still control the Senate. Like you you can talk to us. We still have your back. We're not going to say no. Just let us know what's going on. For that, he is a traitor to the country. But if you've been watching this like fervor for more conflict with Iran over the past week, you know that anyone that speaks up against what's being done is going to be tarred as some sort of traitor. Um, another person who was involved in the briefing was Representative Pramila Jayapal. She said President Trump recklessly assassinated Qasem Soleimani. He had no evidence of an imminent threat or attack. So she said nothing was actually presented, no raw intelligence, no clear indication that they had any reason to believe that Soleimani was about to do something in regards to US forces or civilians. And for what she said, Representative John Rutherford said, I was in the same briefing as you, Representative Jayapal, and this is absolutely false. You and your squad of Ayatollah sympathizers are spreading propaganda that divides our nation and strengthens our enemies. So she said, look, I went there, there was no evidence. So she's an Ayatollah sympathizer. That is like one hair away from saying that she's a terrorist lover. And others in the Democratic Party have already been smeared in that way over the past week or so. And so you got for like this is this is how little room there is for any dissension when it comes to uh, these rumblings of wanting war with Iran, like all the way like to the left on Pramila Jayapal, Ayatollah sympathizer if you have a problem with this. Mike Lee, one of the most conservative Republicans, Benedict Arnold. That's what we're that's what we're seeing right now. And so again, all they're saying, all they're saying is you have to consult with us. Like like think about it honestly in practice how many of these both Republicans and Democrats would go along with some sort of like extended conflict with Iran. We saw it in the run up to war with Iraq. They got cowed by the media and by the president attacking them. Many would in this case. But just for wanting to be involved in it, like brought into the loop a little bit they're being attacked in ridiculous terms. Now I know we don't go to Sarah Huckabee Sanders for anything approaching truth or grasp on reality, but take a look at what I'm not gonna like actually make you listen to her voice, but she was on Fox and Friends this morning and said she can't think of anything dumber than allowing Congress to authorize war. But like she's not insulting like Pramila Jayapal there. She's not insulting Mike Lee. She's insulting the people who wrote the Constitution because as I've been saying this entire thing, it is unambiguous. The Congress shall have power to declare war, grant letters of mark and reprisal and make rules concerning captures on land and water. Keep reading, there's really interesting stuff about raising navies and armies and all of that stuff. Yes, Trump as president will be the commander in chief, like the main manager of the military, but he is not fundamentally in charge of deciding who America goes to war with. That is supposed to be the legislature. That has not been the case for a very, very long time, if it ever was actually the case. But even up to 50 years ago, when they, I think in 1973, they passed the War Powers Act, the legislature was saying, hey, maybe we should look into actually abiding by what the Constitution says. And even with that done, we've had more than my entire lifetime of the executive branch effectively having 100% control over launching us to war. Even in this case, if they wanted to take out the supreme leader of Iran, Trump believes that he has unilateral authority to do that without needing to consult with anyone except perhaps whoever's in the dining room at Mar-a-Lago at the time. And so right now you should know there are efforts both in the Senate and the House, Bernie Sanders and Ro Khanna, they have a bill that's going to try to reapply the War Powers Act. Sounds like Tim Kaine is working on something too. There are efforts to do this, but we know from the experience of our lifetime and beyond that the White House is more resistant in this area than perhaps in any other limitation in its powers. And what you're seeing are former administration officials, conservative pundits, all of them rallying to make sure that the president has sole 100% unilateral authority over what happens with US foreign policy and the use of force abroad. That is not a safe place to be in for, for me, for you, for our entire country. And it's not just because it's Donald Trump, it wouldn't be safe with anyone. But honestly, with someone as immature, incurious, ignorant about world affairs and world history as Donald Trump, do you really want him being the only one deciding when we go to war? Okay, we are gonna take a short break. We come back way more together. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. 
But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. That's him. Across the country, there are more and more people who are no longer satisfied just to live in a democracy where that's like the label applied to our country. They want it to mean something in practice, and they're fighting back to make that happen. And joining us now to talk about some of these efforts going on around the country, Hedrick Smith, a Pulitzer Prize winning former New York Times reporter and editor, and also he's got the new documentary, The Democracy Rebellion on PBS. Hedrick, welcome to The Damage Report. John, great to be with you. Uh, very glad to have you here. So tell me about this democracy rebellion. What are some of the forms that it's taking? Well, the most important thing is it's being ignored by most of the media. What's going on is there is a rebellion going on in states like North Dakota, Florida, North Carolina, South Dakota, Connecticut, California. People are, as you said, fed up with Washington. They counted on the politicians to fix the broken system, stop the big money, stop suppressing the votes, uh, fix gerrymandering, and nothing's happened. So the people are taking power into their own hands. And what's amazing is, contrary to what most people believe today, People power actually works. Last year, the last election in 2018 was the best year in 50 years for political reform in this country. Five states adopted gerrymander reform. States like Florida, Maine, North Dakota, believe it or not, adopted election law reforms. A half a dozen other states made voting easier. Big cities like Baltimore and Phoenix and Denver and Portland, Oregon adopted public funding of campaigns. People power is on the move. People want to fix the system. They want the elections fair. They don't want it dominated by dark money. And they want to get to vote and have their votes counted. And so what, what you're talking about, it sounds pretty historic that people are getting directly involved because of their frustrations over decades of inaction in these areas. And yet, we're apparently not seeing a lot of actual coverage of it in comparison to other aspects of the election, you're things not, like that. You're not seeing coverage, but it's actually begun to have an effect. For example, the gerrymander reform that's taken place in states like Florida and Pennsylvania has already changed the political arithmetic in the election of the last couple of years. So you're seeing a bit of a change in Congress. You're going to see a much bigger change in the next decade because 15 states have adopted gerrymander reform. Um, California has done a pretty good job at smoking out dark money, the Coke money network and, and networks like that. So they've shown how you can force the big donors out into public and when they get out in public, some of them don't want to give. So it begins to at least inform voters. And that does have an impact on elections. So this is not just kind of wonky uh, political science stuff. This is practical power politics and people are starting to understand they got to got to get off the sidelines, they got to get off the couches, and they got to do something and they can get something done. You know, you know what really amazes me about it's the specificity of some of the efforts that are being done that like, when you hear people talk about populist movements and rage against the establishment, there's sort of this like implied, ah, they're mad, but they don't necessarily know how things work or why things are broken. But it seems like in these movements, there's very specific grievances with a sophisticated understanding of the various ways that the system has been manipulated. It seems like there's a lot of education going into crafting the goals of these various efforts. 
John, you're absolutely right on. What's amazing is actually how smart these people are. And we're talking average people. When you look at this film, The Democracy Rebellion, you're gonna see yourself, your cousin, your uncle, somebody you're related to. These are ordinary people. You don't know their names. They're not famous. They're not political stars. They're not like any of the people you just had on the air that everybody knows their faces. Uh, these are ordinary people, but number one, they're angry. Number two, they're smart. Number three, they're organized. And number four, they're tenacious. And number five, they're bipartisan. What's amazing about most of these reform movements that you see in the democracy rebellion is they go across party lines. Um, you've got a, a movement, for example, in North Dakota called the Badass Grandmas of North Dakota. It's <laughs> led by a bunch of women in their 70s. And the one leader is Republican, another leader is Democrat, some of the others are independents. It goes across the board. If you look at Colorado, where they had a vote to roll back Citizens United, that Supreme Court decision that opened the floodgates to all kinds of corporate and billionaire money and campaigns. Uh, what you find is that every single county in the state of California, 64 counties, the red counties, the blue counties, the purple counties, all of them voted about 70% for reform. So when you go to the grassroots, you don't see the partisan divide that you see in Washington and in lots of state capitals. That's impressive. But what's also impressive is what you said, how how smart these people are and how determined they are. In Seattle, I met a woman named Linda Bach. She looks like a walking beer barrel with a green t-shirt on. Cute, funny, folksy, friendly woman. She collected, personally collected 21,000 signatures to put on the ballot a referendum to vote against Citizens United, corporate money, billionaire money and campaigns. You know, you see that all over the place. In Michigan, it was Katie Faye, a 28 year old graduate student who posted something on Facebook that triggered a movement in Michigan that led to 425,000 signatures and a vote in Michigan to roll back gerrymandering. I mean, this there's ferment out there, there's tinder out there, there's anger, frustration and disenchantment, but there's also a realization that the politicians, the powers that be are not gonna fix things. And if it's gonna get fixed, our democracy has gotta be fixed by us, by we the people, we've gotta do it. You know, I, I think that to some extent you've gotten into this area, but I'm curious, um, how much of this do you think, like I know that the, one of the ways that these, these uh, sort of like popular rebellions is often pitched is that it's against the current administration. From what you've seen in these different efforts, let's say Donald Trump loses in 2020. Got nothing to do with Trump. This has got you don't nothing think that do will change it at all? Well, it may, it may change some of the political arithmetic, but the motivation is pre-Trump. What really kicked this off was the Supreme Court decision 10 years ago, literally 10 years ago this month, uh, on January 21st, 2010, the Supreme Court threw over a century old ban on corporate contributions and campaigns, and it angered people. You start to see legislatures in Hawaii and Massachusetts and Connecticut all over the place start to send instructions to Congress to start the process of amending the Constitution to overthrow the Citizens United decision. That's what started. The second things that kicked it off was the Republicans nationwide in 2010 ran an extremely clever campaign to capture the control of state legislatures. Why? Because in 2010, there's a census. In 2011, there's redistricting maps drawn for all the seats in Congress and all the state legislatures. And the Republicans wound up in control of more than 30 state governments and the Democrats in control of only 10. Guess who tilted the map for the 2012 election? And you actually saw it happen in the 2012 election. Republicans actually lost the House race nationwide. They got a million and a half fewer votes than the Democrats did all across the nation for the House of Representatives. But they wound up with a 32 seat majority, not the Democrats, but the Republicans. And that was largely, not totally, but largely because of gerrymandering. What happened was the Democrats got caught by surprise, but some ordinary people said, whoa, this is going against our interests. Gerrymandering is political monopoly. You set up a district so you can win it automatically. And the other side in the independent votes, they don't count. People finally got the message. People took five, six years, but they began to understand it. And now you're seeing a wave of rebellion. It didn't have anything to do with Trump. Uh, Trump's winning or losing, I don't think it's gonna have a huge impact because people understand that in their state, even if the guys aren't labeled Trump, People who are in power like to stack the deck to keep themselves in power. And the average voter doesn't like that. 
You know, so I guess going forward, like one of the reasons I like talking about the stuff like your documentaries is I want my viewers to know about this material, but also I, I want to learn and I want to get better. So you talk about the media um, sort of either either missing these stories or purposefully avoiding these stories hypothetically. What advice would you have for someone like me or other people in media who want like who want to cover this in a way that is going to be productive, that helps people engage in these sorts of issues, these sorts of movements going forward? Get your butt out of Washington, get your butt out of New York. I was a foreign correspondent for the New York Times. I worked in Saigon, I worked in Cairo, I worked in Moscow, I worked in Paris. I worked in probably 30 or 40 countries. I learned very early on as a foreign correspondent, you cannot cover a country well if you sit in the capital. You gotta get out in the country, you gotta cover it. And look at the Washington today, look at the Washington press corps today. It is Trump obsessed. Now I'm not saying Trump isn't important. Let's say Trump and the Washington story is 75% of the American political story. <laughs> I'm sorry, there's another 25% that's being ignored. You gotta get out there. And you have to have managing editors, executive producers, people saying, we're not getting the story. This guy Smith, other people are telling us a story we don't know anything about. Get out there and find out about it. If you assign really good reporters to cover the democracy rebellion, however you wanna call it around this country, they will come back to you with stories and you will start to run them. What you gotta do is to break out of the repertoire habits you're in. Let me tell you, covering a Trump tweet is easy. It's just like on a local uh, 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 coverage. If you've got a police radio, you listen to the fire engines and you go send your cameraman after the fire truck and you cover the fire and you got great pictures on TV and you say, wow, we really did a great job. No, the answer is you didn't do a great job. You covered something that was obvious. Maybe if it's a really big fire and, and there are really problems with the city fire code or the fire department isn't working right, then maybe you're into a good story. But the chances are you've just thrown up something on your television screen or you've just covered a treat that is gonna be overthrown by a treat tomorrow or by in three hours or simply forgotten. Come on, I mean, there's a lot of coverage that's going on outside, inside of Washington, inside the Beltway. And there's an awful lot of talk show stuff going on. Pal, you've probably got it on your program. We've got it on lots of programs. I've stopped watching cable news because the talk shows are so repetitive. You got the same bunch of people sitting around a table in a panel talking about the same news knowing no more, having done no more reporting, haven't learned anything more. I mean, reporting is about getting out and talking to people and getting out of the box you've been sitting in and actually learning something. Listen, years ago, I wrote a book about Russia called The Russians. It was a worldwide bestseller because people hadn't actually taken a look at the Russians. I spent a lot of time with them. I wrote a book six years ago called Who Stole the American Dream about how we got into the inequality and the dysfunctional political system we have now. And lots of other people have gotten on that bandwagon now. But we, we sat there for 30 years as a national media, not covering the growing inequality of American economy and the American society. We watch factories close, we watch jobs go across uh, the world to China, to India, the Philippines, to Korea, wherever. And we reported it as one story at a time. We reported one factory, we reported 500 people losing their jobs. We didn't get to it until there was Occupy Wall Street. It took a social movement to wake up the media to the most obvious and the biggest story in American society over three decades. What I'm saying is we gotta get out of our, of our groove. We gotta get out of our track and go look for something other that's going on, ask people what's going on in their backyards. It's there, it can be found, and it's actually, it's a great story, it's fascinating. Uh, it's probably the most uh, interesting, compelling story about American politics in a long time, and it fits American history. If you go back and look at the progressive era, uh, when women got the right to vote, when we got direct election of senators, when Teddy Roosevelt was busting corporations, and in 1907, when Congress actually passed a law to ban corporate donations to campaigns, 1907. That was going on. Then we got another wave in the 1960s. We had the civil rights movement. We had the women's movement. We had the environmental movement. We had the anti-war movement. We had all kinds of ferment going on. This happens periodically at the grassroots in American history. And I think we're into one of those periods now. And it's up to us in the media to be smart enough to go find the stories and, and get out of the pull uh, that's so dynamic and so attractive and so seductive and maybe uh, not only infectious, but, but it's habit forming of just sitting in Washington and covering what I call the war of words. 
Most of what's going on in Washington is words. People are arguing about words. Everyone's like, when you go kill a, an Iranian general, that's not words, that's action. Mm -hmm. But what's going on out in the countryside, and a lot of times it's action. When there's gerrymander reform, it's gonna make a difference in who gets elected. It's gonna make a difference in who's in the, what the agenda is. Uh, in the in the legislature in Connecticut, they have a system of public funding of campaigns. People who could never think about running for office, middle class, whites, and blacks, professional people who couldn't afford to raise the money to run for a campaign are suddenly in office. And today, in the Connecticut uh, legislature, you have an African American woman who grew up in poverty, was on food stamps at one point, runs a nonprofit for African American women with breast cancer and she is in her fourth term and chairman of the legislative committee on health and social policy. Can you imagine the impact on policy, on the decisions, on the actions of the legislature of that? And it's happened all over the place. There are three times as many minority representatives, there are twice as many women as there used to be mm -hmm. before this system changed. So this is real change, it's not just talk. And people are doing it. And the great thing is one guy from Florida said to me, he said, you know, we have gerrymander reform in Florida. If we can do it in Florida, you can do it in your state. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, Hedrick Smith, I uh, appreciate that, that advice and also uh, your recent work. Everyone should definitely go check it out. And uh, thank you for joining us on the show today. It's on PBS all across the country this month. Thanks so much, John. Thank you. We're gonna take a short break, but stick around. As soon as last Thursday's strike happened, uh, many of us who lived through the run up to the war in Iraq, our, our greatest fear was that it would be the same, that there would be this rallying around the flag, around the president in support of whatever war he wanted to launch us into. But thankfully, one of the things that was different was there was a lot more outspoken anti-war sentiment in the media, but especially in politics. We had the right sorts of senators and representatives speaking out against this run up to war. A great example of that is Ilhan Omar. And um, she's being attacked for the things that she said when she's simply expressing a compassion and understanding and a, you know, a, a goal of peace. But I wanna give you a little bit of what she recently said and then some of the backlash. We caution against war because our allegiance to this country and, it's, and our oath to protect it. Sending teenagers to die or return with lifelong wounds, seen and unseen, is not what uh, it is to carry out our oath. Risking a regional or even global war is not what it means to carry out our oath to protect the American people. I always say war does not have a reset button. Oftentimes, people deal with oppressive, regressive, dangerous, leaders. War is never the answer to saving more lives. War destroys lives. It takes away futures and it destroys generations. So all that Ilhan Omar is saying there is that if you actually want peace, the way to get to that is through pushing for peace, not for war in some tricky formulation. All the right wing pundits are like, no, the best way to get to peace is to kill people in this particular way or to wage brief war in this particular way. That's how you get to peace. So she stands up there and says, we don't want war with Iran. And understand, if you believe Donald Trump, he's saying the same thing. He's saying, I don't want war with Iran either. But despite the fact that ostensibly Ilhan Omar is agreeing with Donald Trump, she has been viciously attacked for that address that I just showed you right there. And that is why at the bottom of the screen right here, we have Ilhan derangement syndrome. Because it is very common these days for anyone speaking out against Donald Trump to be labeled as having Trump derangement syndrome. As if opposing a person who is the antithesis of every political value you have, who is waging horrific human rights abuses domestically and abroad, makes you crazy somehow. But Ilhan Omar, she is actually the impetus for some derangement out there on the right. Because she will say something that Trump himself is saying and they'll go crazy. I want you to go to her Twitter account. 
literally, you can click on anything that she's tweeted, but you could find a bit of her, her video that we just showed you there. And the tweets that she faces are out of their mind. People lose it when she says the most benign things, just a compassionate remark about food stamps or about housing. People lose it on her. And we know why, we're not gonna go into everything, but obviously you know some of the reasons for that. But one area in particular, I just wanna point out, we haven't talked about garbage people in a while, there's a garbage person in this. So in her address right there, at one point Ilhan Omar said that she was feeling a little bit faint, that she feels a little bit of PTSD when she thinks about the prospect of war because of the experience that she had growing up as she did. She was attacked for that, with Laura Ingram saying, call the medic. Ilhan Omar says she feels ill a little bit with all this talk of conflict with Iran. Well, I'm sure her dismissive talk of Al Qaeda 9-11 made a lot of Americans feel way more ill and angry. Laura Ingram wants war with Iran now. She was an outspoken advocate for war with Iraq. You know, she's not admitting that, she's pretending as if she was right back then. She's even attacking people like Joe Biden who also supported war with Iraq as if they were wrong and crazy back then, but not her. She was supportive of the war that killed hundreds of thousands of individuals. She's hot for a war that would do the same or worse with Iran right now. But she's attacking Ilhan Omar for asking us to just pump the brakes a little bit and think before we launch into another Middle East quagmire. So just understand, both of these voices are out there. It's an open question at this point, which one is gonna win out in the end? Okay, we're gonna take a short break, we come back, congressional candidates gonna join us after this. We're joined now by a congressional candidate running in the Democratic primary for Ohio's 10th district, Eric Moyer. Welcome to the Damage Report. Hi, John. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, I'm excited to learn uh, more about your race, about the district. Um, and so for those of us, wa those who are watching this video who might not be familiar with you, um, what is your background? How did you make the decision to run in uh, Ohio's 10th district? Um, so I grew up in the district and I went to um, Ohio State to become an engineer. And then when I left Ohio State, I looked for a job in my district and I, it was hard to find one. And I went to my fallback job, I became a scientist at NASA and <laughs> I was there for- That's your fallback job. <laughs> Well, it was the only one I could find, but it was a good one. Uh, yeah, it was a good one. Mm -hmm. So I was there for several years and I was working in the space biology department. and. Yeah, and I eventually made my way back to the district and didn't like what I was seeing in the national politics. And I thought I'd throw myself out there. And, you know, we've seen normal people all over the country from bartenders to teachers to nurses winning. And I thought, well, we need more scientists in office, so why not give it a try? So let's start there, because um, you know, when we think generally about people who end up as you know, representatives or senators, a lot of them are lawyers. Some doctors, some businessmen, um, but there do not seem to be a lot of scientists. What do you think that having a background in science would help? What would you What would you bring to the role based on your experience? Well, uh, well, the biggest thing is that I'm familiar with understanding facts and data, and when they release government reports and you know, like the climate report, I understand the science that went behind it, and I can be an advocate for the the people who created the reports and to effectively communicate the, the stuff that's in there. So we just need people who understand technical details, and we can we can go forward with that. Okay, so let, let's talk about that first area then. It's certainly something, uh, climate change is something that's very much in the news these days. The fires are still burning in Australia. So uh, in that area, uh, if you make it into Congress, what would you like to be involved in? How would you respond to this crisis? Well, the, there's a youth movement now that's uh, pushing forward the Green New Deal, and I'm definitely on that train. I, I think that it's important to innovate in the future of green energy and and ways that we can improve the, the future of our planet for generations to come, but also to clean up some of the messes in the past. So for example, the EPA Superfund sites, uh, which is what the EPA has designated as hazardous waste sites, there's eight of them in our district alone, and there's 38 in the state of Ohio, and these have been there for decades and have not been cleaned up. So one of my things that I'm running on is cleaning up the messes we've already made and putting that behind us. You know, and that, and that is not something that I often hear congressional candidates talking about. For, but for the people living in those areas, I'm sure that that's uh, that's long overdue that they've been uh, wanting some sort of advocacy in that area. 
Um, now, tell us a little bit about the district itself. It's it's passed politically. What is it like? Um, so it's a district that uh, the biggest city is Dayton, Ohio, but uh, there's a lot of suburbs outside of that, and there's some rural areas as well. And um, you know, President Obama won the one here, and Senator Sherrod Brown won here, and it's a, a very competitive district, but. For whatever reason, the incumbent uh, Congressman Mike Turner has been in office for 17 years now and hasn't really been close in his races. You know, that, that is really interesting because it, it had at the, the state and at the national level has gone for the Democrats multiple times. Um, Trump apparently did win in 2016 in the district, but by a very small margin, just 0.73%. So what is it about Mike Turner? Why has he been able to sort of dodge this trend in the district. And how would you describe what he's done for the district over the past 17 years? Well, if if you recall, the, the Dayton shooting happened and he came out and he said, well, I'm for um, some gun uh, reform. And then he did absolutely nothing on it. He voted against the House bill and that um, was for the background checks, the House Bill 8. And so he he has had made a career of. Okay, it sounds like we might be having some uh, connection difficulties. Let's give it just a few seconds to see uh, if we might be able to reconnect uh, with Eric. We want to learn a little bit more about his platform. No, nope, sounds like unfortunately not. Um, okay, well that that is unfortunate, but thankfully we were able to learn a little bit about um, Eric Moyer's uh, background, um, some of his platform, and also the uh, the opposition that he that he faces um, with a very close district split, very close between Democrats and Republicans. This is one of those districts that I imagine the Democratic Party is going to be very closely focused on. It's an area where clearly Democrats have been able to win at the state and national level. And so uh, take a look at Eric's uh, website. You can learn a little bit about uh, more about him. We've got um, you know some information visible there. Uh, and we're gonna try to get in touch with Eric again and, and maybe finish our conversation at a later date. Uh, with that said though, we are gonna take a break and come back a little bit more to close out the show. If you've been following following the 2020 Democratic primary, you might have noticed that in a number of sources for news that aren't generally all that supportive of Senator Sanders and his bid, there have been more and more editorials saying, hey, he might actually like have a chance. And like sort of acknowledging some of what he brings to the race, his strength in the polls, all of that. One thing that I think might be influencing those recent takes that are like, hey, maybe Joe Biden doesn't have this thing, is that he has been sort of racking up these important endorsements. And the last 24 hours have been a great example of that. So I wanna run through just a couple of the big endorsements that he's gotten that I think could matter going forward. The first from a group that you've heard about quite a bit on this show, and that's the Sunrise Movement. Hi, my name is Varshini Prakash. I am one of the co-founders of and currently serving as the executive director for Sunrise Movement. We're endorsing Bernie Sanders for president because he has proven again and again and again that he understands this issue. He understands its scope. He understands the severity. He understands that it is a social justice issue, that it's about racial and economic justice, that it's about the fight of our lives. And he understands that this isn't just about a conversation happening in Washington. This is about changing the lives of millions of working people across this country for the better. So uh, they, they tweeted about this and said that this had been a vote of their membership. And if you care about climate change, uh, and if you're interested in US activism around the climate crisis, there's really nothing bigger right now than the sun, Sunrise Movement, which has been tapped into legislative efforts to do something about it. You know, their endorsement, I think, pulls an incredible amount of weight in this area, in an issue that for a lot of voters is the most important issue. And I understand that they're not saying that they hate all the other candidates. Uh, they recently released um, grades for Senator Sanders, Senator Warren, and Joe Biden as well. And they generally liked the first two, Joe Biden not quite as much. And I saw that Varshini Prakash, who you saw in that video, she had tweets that were very complimentary towards Elizabeth Warren uh, earlier today, even after this endorsement has gone out. And so understand that he's not the only one that they think would be good on this issue, but they have put themselves behind him. And they did it very early, before any of the primaries, before any of the caucuses. That is a big show of support for Senator Sanders on an important issue. But it's not the only one. Let's also talk about the Dream Defenders, which did their endorsement of Bernie Sanders yesterday. They were initially formed to fight for justice for Trayvon Martin, but has since blossomed into a broader movement for freedom and liberation in Florida. 
Here's a bit of a video that they put out in support of Bernie Sanders yesterday. In 2020, we are not electing a candidate. We are choosing a movement. We endorse affordable housing, livable wages, free education, a comprehensive universal health care system. We endorse justice that heals, not a system that locks our people up and throws away the key. We endorse clean drinking water and breathable air. We endorse a country without walls where children are free from cages. We endorse a free, flourishing democracy and the right to vote. We endorse us and the movement to elect Bernie Sanders for president of the United States of America. And so what you see in both of those endorsements that these are not exclusively youth organizations, but they do tend to be a little bit more shifted towards younger activists, like predominantly in Florida in one aspect across the country in the other, but across a lot of issues as well. I mean, how many different issues did you just see in the video from the Dream Defenders there? And obviously the climate change and environment focused you know, endorsement coming from the Sunrise Movement, which are incredibly important and they show that where the most passion is in American politics, the most, the, the, the strongest, most outspoken advocacy, those are generally the groups that are going not towards Buttigieg, not towards Joe Biden. They tend to be lining up behind Bernie Sanders. And you know, considering that a lot, the national polls have effectively been pretty stagnant over the past couple of months, there's been some movement in the state polls. Maybe we'll look at those on tomorrow's show. But seeing these groups lining up before Bernie Sanders, not after he's already won a bunch of early states, but going out and doing it when it's risky before the first votes, that is a that is a big risky show of confidence and, and I really do appreciate that. As a reminder of how important some of these things are to these groups, like the, the environmental um, support for Bernie Sanders that you just saw coming from the Sunrise Movement, I just saw today, we don't have time to go super in depth, but the EPA is changing one of their big regulations having to do with how uh, permit bids for uh, major infrastructure projects going forward, how that's gonna be changed. They're going to be taking out the consideration for effects on climate. So at the same time that you have all of this activism around the climate crisis, you have these major disasters going on around the world. The EPA is going to ease up on their concern for how major pipelines being built, those sorts of things are gonna impact the climate going forward. The only way that we're gonna stop that, because this, is, this doesn't have to go through the legislature, Trump and the EPA can just do it themselves for the most part, these sorts of things. The only way you're gonna stop that is with a change at the top. And for that, you need a president who cares about these issues and they clearly think that Bernie Sanders is the person. Um, but also, again, if you want a youth activist, now we have an individual endorsement. I saw Bernie Sanders tweeting out, um, uh, actress and activist um, uh, Emily Ratajkowski, she also had a video uh, endorsing Bernie Sanders. Uh, here's a section of that. Women in this country have so much to lose as far as health care. This is a potential moment in the Supreme Court where Roe v. Wade could be overturned. So whoever's going to be our next Supreme Court justice will be up to the next president in the next four years. So it's very important to have someone who advocates for women's rights in position of power. I understand why sometimes it doesn't feel appealing to vote. And I think that's really important to talk about because a lot of people are like, how could people not vote? What's wrong with them? And I think it's, you know, comes down to the fact that there aren't often candidates that represent the change that you wanna see. They don't represent what you want for yourself. So it feels so distant and sort of unimportant. That's not the case in this election. There's so much at stake here. And getting out to vote, your one vote makes a change. We will regret it forever if we don't take this opportunity to join this movement. So for that video and for the other two that I showed you, um, there's much more to it and you should definitely go track those down. The organizations and individuals have spread them. Also Bernie Sanders and his campaign have been tweeting them out uh, as well. Um, but they show the, the broad range of issues that people are now organizing around Bernie Sanders around. I'll say again, as I do whenever I talk about something like this, I myself have endorsed Bernie Sanders, so understand the, the bias that I bring to this sort of story. Um, but I think you should know that these are some high profile endorsements that are all coming down in just the last 24 hours. I will say one more thing, this is not a formal endorsement, I just thought it was kind of funny. Larry David, who has been doing impressions of Bernie Sanders on SNL recently, he was on Stephen Colbert. And Stephen Colbert asked him, is there anything you would like me to ask Bernie tomorrow night? Larry David said, I would say, I would beg him to drop out so I don't have to keep flying from LA to do SNL. I thought when he had that heart attack, that would be it. I wouldn't have to fly in from LA, but you know he's indestructible, nothing stops this man. If he wins, do you know what that's going to do to my life? Do you have any idea? I mean, it'll be great for the country, great for the country, terrible for me. 
Now that is not an endorsement. It's not an endorsement, but it's pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. Okay, so anyway, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining me and my sore throat. Tomorrow, Brett Ehrlich is gonna be joining us, so we should have a lot of fun to close out the week. A week that has been quite rough, I think we can all agree. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.